Heavenly Father, we pray that you will bless us with your word and bless your word to us this morning. Amen. Amen. Won't you be seated? Thank you, I need that. It struck me during the reading, if you ever want to upset your mother, try telling people that your father was a wandering other man. <laughs> Some time ago, when I was uh, quite ill, one of my granddaughters came to me. Um, she was the first one that I had looked after from the age of six months for a year. So the relationship has always been quite close. And she came to me and she brought to me a huggy toy, which is the best way I can describe it. And what was special about this huggy toy was that she had been almost inseparable from it for quite a long time in her life. It went with her everywhere, uh, probably except into the bath, but it was a part of her. Anyway, she came to me with this huggy toy, which patently had some of her best memories and was a source of great comfort to her. And she gave it to me and said, Papa, I brought this to you to, to make you better. And I, I was deeply moved by that, and, and still am, because it's still uh, on a little bookcase where I can see it uh, every day. And it struck me that this was the wonder of love and the preparedness to make a sacrifice for the benefit of somebody else. And that seemed to pull together so much in my mind. It was giving away something precious for the benefit of others. It wasn't just any old toy that she'd hauled out from the bottom of the toy box because her mother had said, well, you better take him something. This was her idea from the love, the relationship that we had, and it was just very, very special. Now, at this stage, you're, you're all supposed to say, ah, oh. <laughs> there you go. But giving is what love is all about. And so often I forget that, um, and I'm sure others do as well. But if love is going to be real, if love is going to embrace other people, it has to involve a giving. And very often it has to involve a giving of something which is precious to us. It might be a giving away of something. It might be a giving up of something. But in one way or the other, it's a giving. And in the Old Testament, we find that God in his giving to us and is loving his people is saying to them and getting them into or getting the idea into them that being loved by him and loving him back will involve a giving. And in the beginning, in that Old Testament uh, period, the... Um, sacrifices, the giving back to God, were set down by God as he began to get people to understand what it might involve. So we had the reference in the reading to the giving of the first fruits. As the harvest comes in and you say, wow, what a harvest, God says, take the first fruits and give them to me because you wouldn't have had the harvest without me. <clears throat> You wouldn't have had the land without me. You wouldn't have had the seed without me. You wouldn't have had the water without me. You wouldn't have had the sun without me. You wouldn't have had me looking over everything. The harvest is wonderful because of me. Just remember that. And of course, it's something we need to remember today. When we get the fruit of our hands, the fruit of our labors, remember who made it possible. Of course, it's God. And he specifies the tithe. He specifies what to do, what to give if you've sinned. All of it has an element of giving back to God, and it involves God in these areas in our lives. Then we come to the New Testament, and we find that there's a dramatic movement there's a movement away from the law which requires us to give into the grace where God gives. 
And instead of requiring something from us when we have sinned and fallen short or whatever, God gives to us what he would require from us so that we could give it back to him. So God gives us a death on the cross so we can give back to God the death on the cross, which should have been us, but is Jesus. And so we benefit. Isn't that amazing? That God gives to us what we need to give to God. And he does it for us. He gives us the death for sin, the death on the cross, the Jesus who is Saviour. I find that stunning. There is God giving his best huggy toy to us for our comfort and our salvation. It's mind-blowing. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Everything that God could think of giving us is in Christ. And as I've mentioned before, all we need to do is to plug into Christ to have access to it. Just as all we have to do on good days in any event is to plug into the wall socket and we have access to power. We understand the symbolism. It's all in Jesus. And that is God's great gift to us. But we also find that giving is still required, expected of us, because the scripture talks of giving. And that's because giving is a part of love. And if we are going to accept love from God, and if God's love is going to be poured into our hearts, and if we are going to respond back by loving God, then there will be an element of giving in it. But it's no longer a legalistic giving. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I don't know if you've quite got there yet, but you know when DG comes around and you say, oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> but in a way, we should be saying, oh, good. You could use the argument, well, that's not giving to God, it's giving to the church. But no, 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 that's, that's cutting hairs, splitting hairs. The church is God's. The church is an expression of God. A church which is attractive and well looked after and well maintained is to the glory of God. But it's giving. And when we give, out of the fullness of our hearts, the people on the side of the road or others. It represents part of our giving to God. Remember Jesus said, whatever you did to the least of these, you do to me. That even giving a cup of water to one of his, his, his disciples will not uh, go unnoticed by God. So giving is there. And we need to remember that, that it is our privilege to be able to give to God for his purposes, for his ministry. And so let's just have a look quickly at what I, I would call the four great sacrifices, because we're looking at sacrificial giving as part of our worship. And the first one is in the Great Commandment. And the Great Commandment says... Love the Lord your God with all. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, 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 no. There's a pause there. 
Notice that little word. And so often it's the little words that are so important. Love the Lord your God with all. all. Not 10% or 20%, <coughs> but with all. And if you look up all, <laughs> it means all. So now, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength and with all of your mind with every fiber of your being and all of it, with all that represents you, me, which would involve my home and my car and my work and my bank account and whatever it might be. It's all of me. Love the Lord your God with all of that. Because all things come from God and of his own we give to him. And in reality, everything I have comes from God. And God could ask me for it, including my life, at any moment, today, or the next day, or whatever. So there's the first sacrifice to acknowledge that I'm called to love God even with the small change in my pocket. And if you don't carry small change, even with your credit card. <laughs> and that leads us on to the second of the great sacrifices, which is commitment to God. That the commitment, our commitment to God, what we give to God in terms of commitment is everything, is all. Jesus put it this way, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Money. Don, you cannot serve both God and money. And we battle with that. Seek first, says Jesus, God's kingdom and his righteousness. And it comes in the context of him saying, don't worry about what you should be wearing or what you should be eating or whatever. God knows. But seek first, even beyond your next meal, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, because this has an eternal consequence. Your next meal, if you missed it, would probably not be life-threatening. But if you found the kingdom of God, it's life-changing. It's life-enriching. It's life-enhancing. It's eternal. And so what we do is we give up to God our natural focus on our own pleasure and well-being. And we trust him to love and care for us and to give us in himself the fulfillment we desire. Because we can spend so much time finding fulfillment or trying to find fulfillment in activities. Just think of the Olympics. Somebody has written, the Olympics are amazing because every day you will find someone who's having the best day of their life. And he went on to say, but they're surrounded by people who aren't. The ones who come second and third. The one who just missed third and became fourth. The ones who didn't, in fact, make the team at all. The ones who were not able to play that sport or any sport at all. because they couldn't afford to, or they didn't have the physical capabilities. So the Olympics are false in so many ways. And one of the huge privileges I've had as being a priest is to 
go along when we used to do it this way, the altar veil, and give communion into the hands of people. And I would see the hands. And there were many hands. And I looked at them and I thought, those hands have never held a cricket bat or a golf club or a tennis racket. In fact, those hands look as if they've done nothing all, life, all their life but wash. Wash clothes, wash dishes. You can see the, the lines and the, the soap in the hands. They've done nothing but serve and serve and serve. And then when I looked at their faces and recognized them, I saw what lovely people they were. Interesting, hey? Where our priorities lie. But life is not about me. Life is about God, and particularly about Jesus, who is life itself. And it's about my life with and in him. And God put it this way. Choose life. So that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life. Not your sporting achievements. Not your intellect. Not your wealth. Not your poverty. Jesus. I am the way, the truth and the life. And so I give up my dependency on the things of the world and I look to Jesus and his love as my huggy toy, the one I go to for comfort, for assurance and reassurance. And that commitment brings us to the third commitment, which is holiness. To give up the things of the world, the values of the world, and to look at the things of God. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, says Paul, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the, the renewing of your mind. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices. And we live in a world where people don't know what to do with their bodies. Something's gone wrong. But God knows. Because God created these bodies in a particular way, for a particular purpose. And over the years, they've been abused and misused and slowly, 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 it's become natural. But God says, no, I made the body in a certain way, to be used in certain ways. Give up the ways of the world and be set aside for me. And so we may find that as we engage with this commitment, there may be some Geth Gethsemane moments for us where something within us is pulling us one way and the will of God is pulling us another way and we need to choose which way we're going to go. Giving up the ways of the world for the ways of God. And we will fail. But 
the commitment to holiness is this, that when we fail, even if we are flat on our faces, we crawl back to God and we climb up his leg, so to speak, and to say, I'm back because this is the place I want to be. This is where I should be. I need your forgiveness, your cleansing, your help, your health, your strength. And as many times as I fail and fall, I will keep coming back until one day I will not fall again. That's part of the commitment to holiness and to God. It's in David's Psalm 51. Wash me and I will be clean. Cleanse me and I will be whiter than snow. Give me a pure heart. The new, a steadfast spirit within me. No matter how many times I fall, I come back. I come back. <coughs> and then finally, <coughs> excuse me, a commitment to others. And this follows on the, com the commitment to God in, in the first of the great commandments. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus would say, now go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you because I am the way and I've told you the way. Teach them the way. Show them the way. Lead them on the way. And through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. And again, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Sharing with those in need. And that's at the heart of Jesus' story of the vine. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. And it's the branches that bear the blossom and the branches that bear the fruit. And the fruit is not for the vine. The fruit is for the passers-by. The fruit is for those who need it. So it's not for the vine to accumulate. It's for the vine to give and to keep on giving. And you know what happens when you prune. There's more growth and more growth. And so the wealth that God invests in me is a wealth to be shared with others. This is the fruit of the Spirit. And Jesus talks of us bearing much fruit to the glory of God. And the more we give, the more God can replace it with. And all of this is not for our glory, but it is for the glory of God. As I get out of the way and I allow God to be central in my life and situation. Just listen to uh, Paul. In him, we were chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put hope in, our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. That's why we were created, to for the praise of the glory of the Lord God Almighty. That is our purpose, and it's a good purpose. It's not a poverty-envisioned purpose. It's a purpose of abundance, that God's love might flow into us and through us and from us, and there might be abundant change to the glory of God. And so Paul says, therefore, I keep asking. And notice that word keep. He goes on asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Not just of him, but personally. You and God 
one-on-one, -on -one, that you might know him better. And I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. The hope of your identity as a son, as a daughter of the Lord God Almighty. To be taken into the house of God and there to live forever where God will not only provide for you but ensure that there is no more death or dying or, or, or crying or pain. Where things will be good and glorious and complete throughout eternity. And I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Can you hear what Paul is praying for? <coughs> that he may strengthen you, me, individually, through power, by, in, with power through his spirit living within me so that Christ himself may dwell in my heart through faith, not as a concept, but as a reality. Jesus in me, the hope of glory. And I want to tell you that as much as I can preach like this, I still have not fully absorbed, absorbed the truth of it because I believe that the moment I fully grasp what Paul is saying, I will shock you because I will explode. No, I mean that. Because as Paul is talking about this, what he gives me is the vision of a balloon and he's trying to get us to see that in the spirit and with Christ within us, we grow and grow and grow in our potential to such an extent that our human bodies cannot contain it. That's the vision of Paul. And if I don't explode, there'll be a popping sound and I'll go off like a rocket. <laughs> Hallelujah. There goes Jerry. <laughs> that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. A little girl came to me and said, I want you to have my special toy because it will make you better. Have you any idea what that did to me inside? Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory. To him be glory. Glorious. So it's our great calling, our great equipping, and our great empowering as we respond to God to believe and trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour, to willingly sacrifice our individual and independent desires in favour of his will and purpose, which is good, to trust that in him we will find our greatest love, our greatest peace, and our greatest fulfilment as a beloved child of the Father Almighty. And so to invest all of our God-given time and talents and treasures in him and for his glory. His word and prayer. His work and ministry. For his people and his passion. Now and forever. Thank you. Somebody said amen. Hallelujah. God be with you.